going to introduce you to the next panel, Martin Varsevsky. Hello, Martin. You, you, you'll keep your cut. It's a bit cold. You have a sauna. We should do a sauna. I come from Spain. Oh, you should take a mic. You come from Spain, <laughs> right? I know you're coming from Spain. Here you go. I flew in, I flew in from Spain. That's why I need uh, to keep myself warm. Welcome, Uriel Oyon from uh, TechCrunch France, uh, and who is flying from Tel Aviv. Martin Varsevsky, Jeff Clavier, who is uh, coming from San Francisco. We have uh, Eric Archambault coming from uh, London and Belgium a little bit. We don't know where you live exactly. Everywhere. Right. And Fred Wilson. So the floor is yours, Uriel. Have fun. Thanks. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, we have about uh, 40 minutes, something like that. So just let's, let's kick off. We have probably one of the most, uh, one of the scariest panel today. We're going to talk about uh, funding during recession. Uh, we'll, maybe we question that, uh, that title. I'm not sure we're already in a recession, although it may be coming. So if you guys could, uh, could start off uh, presenting yourself like one minute, uh, I'm also asking you already right now to think about the name of a company that you have in your portfolio for a surprise question at the end of the panel. Uh, Fred, you want to start? Hi. Hi, everybody. I'm Fred Wilson. I'm a venture capital investor based in New York. My firm is called Union Square Ventures. I also write a blog about technology and venture capital and a couple of other things. It's called AVC. And we started investing here in Europe last year. And we're excited and plan to continue to invest here in Europe. And uh, I'm happy to talk about tough times and how we get financed in a different market. So I'm Eric Archambault, a venture capitalist in Europe. We um, invest throughout Europe and we back uh, entrepreneurs who have global ambitions. We help them grow their companies throughout Europe, throughout the world. And uh, I'd be ha happy to also talk about tough times and good times. Uh, Jeff Clavier, Frenchman based, based in Silicon Valley for eight and a half years investing in Silicon Valley, I'm afraid. Uh, except that I have a couple of projects in Europe, Wikio being one, which was an old investment of mine, so I want to commend Pierre for breaking even. Good job. Uh, what I do is consumer internet. I've done 45 deals, um, which are still active over the past four and a half years. A year and a half ago, I launched a fund called SoftTech VC, which is a $12 million seed fund, which has done 32 deals in 18 months. So busy. Martin, can you try to talk? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll stick to the one minute. I'm Martin Versovsky. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I had three exits of over half a billion as an entrepreneur. And I had this January my first exit of over half a billion as a VC. So I figured I would join the VC panel because I didn't do any of the work. And it still was a nice exit. Great. So let, let's kick off by trying to um, like understand where we are now. So we're all talking about you know, the tough times we're in. From your point of view, how bad is the situation right now? And do we have really a clue about what's happening? You know, uh, it's interesting because you have very different profiles, Europe, America, angel investor, uh, established investment uh, uh, entities. How, how bad do you think is the situation right now for you? For me, not so bad. I think that uh, investors who have capital, it's a great time because valuations have come down. And if you have a permanent capital base or a semi-permanent capital base that you have confidence is going to be there for the next three or four years to support the investments you make, I think it's a great time to be investing. I think that the web is building, is allowing us to build companies that will change the way business is being done for the better. And that's what we're doing, and that's what we're going to continue doing. So I think it's a great time to be an investor. I think if you're an entrepreneur and you're working on great new ideas, uh, it's a great time to be an entrepreneur. But I think you have to be prepared to do things uh, on smaller amounts of money. And you have to be uh, prepared to raise money at lower valuations. And you need to uh, be prepared to have those financings take longer. So, so Fred, like by the end of the year, are you going to close any deal? Between now and the end of December? Uh, we closed one today. Does that count? OK, congratulations. Thank you. Well, um, 
I think it's, um, it's a bit more difficult than that. Um, I think it's actually a great time to be an investor if you have permanent capital base. It just happened that 95% of the investors don't have a permanent capital base. So they all are all running for cover right now. They are very much afraid. It's very different from 2001, 2002, where um, the VCs didn't fear for their own lives. So they would continue to invest. They would look for a bargain. They felt that they would pick some good deals. The deals would end up being you know, great companies at some point, and they'd get more capital from their own investors. Today, a lot of firms are very much afraid that they may not get more money from their investors, even for current funds, because they may have defaults. It's a fear. It's not really a, uh, the reality yet, but they, they fear that it could happen. So they tend to be extremely careful about making new investments. They're even more careful about making sure there's no accident, what they call accident, in their portfolio, meaning companies going under. So they spend an enormous amount of time looking for you know, what's going on in their portfolio. They have no time to spend on new companies. And that creates really a um, self-fulfilling prophecy of having less startup being funded and, and so on. So I think it's, it's not a great time, quite frankly, neither for the VCs nor for the entrepreneurs. And something needs to happen for people to start reinvesting. I think in the next few months, there will be some kind of realization that the, you know, the world is not totally, it may, by the way, but the world may not falling apart around them. And they may start seeing some bargain in prices because prices will go down and they start reinvesting. But right now is not a good time. Good. So the way I look at it is, um, is really about survival on both sides, investors and, and, um, and entrepreneurs. If ever your company can go through 2009 without raising a dime of money, then you will potentially survive and be in a stronger position. If ever you have to raise money in 2009 because that's when you were supposed to, then it might actually be a very tough value proposition because the bar that VCs will set you know, to get you funded is actually a movable target. And then they're not really sort of clear as to which hurdle you have to clear you know, to, um, to get you funded. So a couple of my, three of my companies have been fun funded for the next round in the last two months at reasonably decent valuations. And so that was sort of the good news. What's not clear to me is what's gonna happen in Q1 or Q2 next year, where there will be, as, as Eric said, a lot of uncertainty for the VCs as to whether their own capital calls, which is basically when you're a VC, you don't have $120 million in the bank. You have a commitment from your own LPs or your own limited partners investors to give you money when you need to and you make a call whenever you need that capital. And these days, those calls get a, no, thank you, we won't do the call. We won't just give you the money. And so that creates a lot of uncertainty in the market where even if you have a commitment, even if you have a term sheet, you're not sure whether you'll see the money coming through. M Martin, you've been pretty active as an, an angel investor in, in the past years in Europe, in the US. Like, did something change for you now? Are you going to invest more, less? Are you still looking at opportunities? Yeah, no, I'm looking at opportunities. But maybe what I wanted to do is to tell briefly the story of how I was bankrupt for a month in 98, just to explain how bankruptcy can catch up with you and how, how you can lose everything because of the markets in a bad market like this for a very short period of time. So I had $80 million of VATL shares in 98 I borrowed $13 million against the VATL shares to start Jastel. The crisis of 98 came, the shares went from 20 to four, the bank called the loan, and it was a margin loan. I was totally bankrupt. They could come after my home, after everything. I was so worried that I went mountain biking, I had a terrible accident, I was picked up by an ambulance, and I was in no condition to sign my bankruptcy papers. So the Credit Suisse bankers gave me 30 days to get back in shape to sign my own bankruptcy. I spent a month in the hospital, and when I got out of the hospital, the shares were back at 13, I sold them, and I wasn't bankrupt anymore. With that short story, what I wanted to tell you, <laughs> thank you, <Well> done. <laughs> and, and it was a terrible time for me, but what I wanted to say is that a lot of, a lot of times for companies, being alive or being dead is a matter, in these crazy markets, it's a matter of timing. 
So the question is, is this a 29 or is this a 98 or is this somewhere in between a 29 and a 98? And unfortunately, I don't have an answer. Ariel, let me just, I want to follow up on something that, uh, that Eric was saying. And I think it is true that uh, there are uh, risks in the venture capital business of limited partners, the people who supply us the money, not necessarily meeting those capital calls. But we have made three capital calls on our two funds in the past month, and we have not had one investor fund late. And we've had five phone calls from our largest limited partners asking us if anybody is defaulting on our fund because they would like to pick up those interests, obviously, at a discount. I think there's enough demand from investors to be in the best funds that if limited partners default from the best funds, and I don't mean from you know, XYZ ventures that no one's heard of, but I mean from the Sequoias and Axels and, and uh, the firms up Wellington. here, Wellington and, and Jeff's Fund, um, I think that there will be demand uh, to fill those slots at a discount that people who are selling will lose money. But I, but I think for the best funds, they're in business and they will continue to be in business. So do, do you feel like, you know, during this, we all saw this Sequoia presentation. I, I assume that a lot of you saw this, uh, this PowerPoint presentation that was on the net. Uh, do you think it kind of arrived a little late and that maybe, you know, all these pre prescriptions and recommendations about how to behave and manage a business is something that you know, any company should do at any time and that eventually you know, the VCs have been a little responsible by overfunding all these startups out there. Do you share this kind well, of so point Sequoia of view? invested with funds, so I could, I could answer that. I, with all respect to Sequoia, and I thank them for the investment in fund, I really resented the way that presentation was uh, given to the portfolio companies of Sequoia. Instead, I prefer the way another investor in fund, Allen & Company, presented the situation to us. First of all, Allen & Company presented at least six months earlier. They basically told me, Martin, you have no idea what's coming. And they gave us a much useful warning, not in the middle of the storm when you're the skipper of of a CEO, a CEO of a boat that's like maybe, you know, in the middle of a disaster and they tell you, oh, look how bad the situation is. And a company came six months before with a warning and it was just done in a much more polite, uh, useful manner. So I felt the Sequoia warning came too late. It wasn't a warning anymore. And it was too severe, get real or go home. I felt that was, you know, not polite. What do you guys think about it? So I think, you know, the, a lot of entrepreneurs started sort of adapting and adjusting before the Sequoia sort of presentation meeting and so on and so forth. What it was useful for, though, is that it removed any opportunity for anyone to, ha to be in a state of denial. Because after Sequoia saying, you know, the, the sky is falling, everyone sort of listened and sort of adapted very quickly. Because what happened last time, back in 2000, 2001, people sort of cut a bit and waited for three months and cut a bit and waited for three months. Whereas if they had cut earlier and deeper, they might actually have survived. So I think it was sort of useful from that standpoint. It was a bit too um, sort of dramatic, but you know. I you, think think yeah, you cannot deny that there is a, um, a real storm coming up um, that will affect um, the startup companies in one way or another, some more than others, but it, you know, in our portfolio, we, sp we spent a lot of time, we did spend a lot of time in the past few months, much more time than usual, working with the entrepreneurs and the, the teams of managers reviewing their business plan for next year. And um, what's interesting is between September and December, for those companies who are selling to, the, to other businesses, we have seen a dramatic drop in the orders that those companies were passing. Even orders that were passed were not honored. So there is something going on. <coughs> and if you were not prepared, or if you are not prepared already for that to happen, you actually run into trouble. So I think it was a good thing to do it earlier than Sequoia, um, uh, the Sequoia call. But I think it's, um, it's a natural um, reaction to the reality of the market. It just happened that it's a bigger wave uh, than, uh, than usual, and you just need to take bigger precautions than usual. I know, Fred, do you have anything to add? 
to that. Okay, good. Um, the, uh, uh, there was a great post uh, last week uh, uh, written by Paul Graham for Y Combinator uh, on the kind of different path that the internet is taking and the uh, obvious uh, less necessity of entrepreneurs to turn to VCs to start off their business. Um, do you feel that we are in a period where the VC model starts to be threatened because entrepreneurs can start off you know, for less money, for less money, their business, and obviously don't need really VCs right away uh, you know, to, to, uh, to move on and to, uh, and to really succeed and maybe come to you guys later? Do you think that there is some kind of separation or dichotomy between entrepreneurs and VCs that is being accelerated by this crisis? I think that uh, I, I wrote uh, a post about this about a year and a half ago, which um, is called uh, Why Web 2.0 is Actually a Gift to the Venture Capital Community. And the assertion that I made in that post, and I still believe is true, is that it used to be that the amount of capital that it would take to start a company was relatively linear with time. So it would take two million to go the first year, or say four million to go the first year, four million to go the second year, four million to go the third year, and another four million to go the fourth year. I think what's happened now is that uh, the curve looks different where you can go the first year for 250,000 and then the next year is a million and the next year is three million and the final year is six million or something like that. So I think that's a benefit to entrepreneurs for sure because they suffer less dilution in the beginning. But I think it's a benefit for venture capitalists as well because we get our crack at the companies when they're more developed, when more risk has been wrung out by the entrepreneur. We can deploy our three or six million dollars. There's a whole wave of, there's a whole layer of angel capital that can exist to fund that first 250,000 or maybe even the first million 250 so people like Jeff can play. And, and, and I think that's all great for the business. So I, I think that is less le if it takes less capital to start a business, that's good. I, as the entrepreneur here, I just wanted to say that I am thankful in every business I built, I always did it with venture capitalists. I never owned more. In the end, I was always diluted to something like 20%. But when the exits come at over half a billion, 20% is still a lot of money. And I'm very grateful to the VCs that I always had. I, this negative comment I made about Sequoia only related to the style in which they presented, but I encourage VCs, uh, uh, sorry, entrepreneurs to work with VCs because who cares exactly what percentage you own? The key thing is that you be successful and with their money, you're more likely to be successful. And I don't mean it as a commercial, I just mean it. So, so something beyond money, we all know it's not only about that, uh, but you know, probably know this site called The Funded, uh, which is a kind of user-generated reviews of VCs, and it looks like when you look at this site that a lot of entrepreneurs, uh, love is the theme of the conference, are not really in love with the VC industry. I mean, there's a lot of hate around the VC industry. Do you think that there is a kind of shift happening right now, and that beyond the money that you know, some entrepreneur can get from, from you guys, uh, there is something that is missing in the relation between, you know, the love relation there is between an entrepreneur and a VC. Well, so, you know, it's an interesting relationship because um, we're sort of a, you know, older brother kind of, kind of um, for, for CEOs where we help them, we support them, we call them, but we kick their ass when we need to. And sometimes there's, there's this very fine line where we want to be close to them because it's a real deep personal relationship where we're going to, you know, be together for like three, five, seven years sometimes. But, you know, at some point we might sort of come to the realization that they've reached their level of incompetence or limits where we have to sort of, you know, show them the door or get someone, you know, to get the company to the next level. And so it's, it's, a, it's a strange relationship sometimes. I think that on the funded, the issue I have with uh, what we don't know is who has actually worked with those VCs because a lot of the people who complained about the VCs actually are not their portfolio company CEOs and only those guys know them well. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's not easy to have a, a constructive relationship either for the VC nor with the CEO or the entrepreneur. I think people have to admit a couple of things. One is um, the role of the VC is really about guidance 
but guidance is something you do um, with a distance. And so you cannot, if you still have the entrepreneurial bug inside your body, you cannot be a good VC. If you want to take the decision for the guy in front of you, you have to let him make some mistakes, otherwise, you know, he's never going to appreciate what you are doing. And vice versa, I think you don't want to look from your, you know, to look from your VC, you're not going to search for the answer. The answer is very much like, a, you know, the Oracle a long time ago, you know, you ask for something and they may not give you the direct answer, but they may inspire you into looking something in the right direction. Now, the role of the VC at the same time is not to let go any issues that may become threatening for the business. And I've I also got funded when I was an entrepreneur in Silicon Valley for quite a bit of time. I got funded the twice by Sequoia, tw two different partners, and they had both the same um, unknowing habit to pick on the only issue I was trying to hide during the board <laughs> meeting. It was, you know, it was big or small. I was trying not to talk too much about it. They would just, after two minutes, pick on it, never let go, and call me after the board meeting to make sure we'd address the issue. I thought that was really annoying, but you know what? They were right. And at the same time, I had other investors that would, when I was an entrepreneur, you know, really focus on details or focus on things. That was not very helpful. Or, you know, gave me thousands of contacts of people I should talk to about things. That was not really the issue either. So I think it's, um, it's a little bit of a love-hate relationship. It's not love-hate, it's actually tension. But the tension is very healthy. Fred, how is your relation with your portfolio company? How do you, how do you work with them? Well, I, I, I think Eric said it wonderfully. Uh, good VCs uh, help entrepreneurs be better, and bad VCs bug entrepreneurs about stupid things that they shouldn't be wasting their time dealing with. And I think that's one of the reasons, one of the many reasons that venture capitalists get a bad reputation in this business. Another problem with the relationship between entrepreneurs and VCs is we say no 99% of the time. I just had a meeting today with an entrepreneur here in Paris who I've now met with twice. Wonderful guy. I actually like him and I like his business. I've said no to him twice now. He's probably saying to himself, what do I have to do to get this guy to say yes? It's so hard. And Part of the problem that um, we in the venture business have is that we don't say no well. We just say no, and we don't explain why, and we don't take the time to, to give a helpful suggestion in the, in the process. And part of that is that when you say no 99 times a day, we don't say no 99 times a day, but when you say no 10 or 15 or 20 times a day, it's hard to be really thoughtful and helpful 10 or 15 or 20 times a day. But the reality is, that that's the only thing you can do for an entrepreneur if you're going to say no, you at least think you should try to give them some reason why. And it, I don't know that it's a solvable problem at the end of the day, um, but you know, that's, where, that's where I think a lot of the problems lie between VCs and entrepreneurs. So talking about saying no, do you think that a year ahead from now, you guys are going to say no more often than you did the past 12 months? You don't know, you know? Well, <laughs> I'd like to answer that. The answer is yes. It is. Um, yes, you're going to say more uh, no. Yes. Right, everybody I'm gets that. <laughs> but the reason why you say no more frequently, even though I only invest maybe in a company every two months or so or three months, is because now the chain is broken. So when people show you a project that requires um, blind finding horizon that you don't see, how this project will get funded again until it makes money. Those leap of faith investments that you used to make in a functioning market, you make them less in a sick market, like the market we have now. Yeah, Good. let me offer a, um, a couple of data points. Um, just a few years ago, I got um, an analyst to actually look through, it's a fairly painful um, analysis, through 25 years of, of um, investment um, from VC-backed companies, how many VC-backed companies in a given cohort, so a company born in 1984 is a, you know, it's part of a cohort, 85 next cohort and so on, how many companies born in each year 
would lead to a success company. Successful companies, and for lack of a better definition, we used a company that reached at least at one point in our life before the company got acquired, maybe, or you know, went public or whatever, or went bankrupt later, but they reached a hundred million dollars in revenues. That's a good, you know, good successful um, uh, benchmark. So when you look at 25 years of data, starting in, in um, 1980, you find that it's, it's frightening. It's almost a flat number. So obviously, the, you know, if you measure in, 90, in 2005, the companies born in 2005, none of them reached 100 million, which is reassuring. But starting 10 years before that, 95 and before, it's a very flat curve, which means a couple of things. One, every year, regardless of the, um, the, the cycle, regardless of whether it's a great recession or a great year, you pretty much have the same number of great companies being born, which has a couple of implications. One is you should, in theory, not stop investing any years. And, and the second one is you'll probably have the same ratio of, let's call that, not that great companies and great companies. So to answer your question now, after all this data, <coughs> if, uh, if I have a thousand people coming every year to see us, which unfortunately is almost uh, the right number. So if you have thousand people trying to reach you and you only have 10 companies that are gonna make it, you'd better pick not much more than these 10 companies. So the ratio of people that you're gonna say no to is gonna be the same. So it will be the same. Will that change for you, Fred? Is next, will next year be a year will you make more deals than this year, less deal than this year? Say less no or more no? I think that there may be less people knocking on my door next year. Uh, I mean, I said no a lot in 2008, probably more than I've ever said in my life. And uh, I can't imagine that 2009 could beat that. I, I think there's going to be a chance that a lot of entrepreneurs might decide uh, to take the year off, which would be a good, maybe next year would be a good year to go to the beach. Um, so I, I think that it's not likely to be more for that very reason. Um, but one never knows. I think also that we're going to spend a lot of time with our companies, the existing ones in the portfolios, to make sure that you know they go through 2009 as as well as possible to survive and everything. And if ever they have to raise money, then we'll put all our efforts behind that, and we'll become sort of money raising machines as well. So, so I'm um, sorry. No, I just wanted to say that I don't. We don't know how 2009 is going to be. Bad. And I. It's going to be bad. Well, you think it's going to how be bad? very bad. And I only think in terms of scenario probabilities. So I think there's a possibility that it will be horrendous. There's also a possibility that it will be amazingly good. And then there's somewhere in between, more of the same, a market sort of dragging sideways as it is now, and unemployment creeping up to 10%, 11% in the States, in Europe. So I have also, uh, decided to invest more in funded ideas, non-market sensitive for the long term. At Fon, by the way, last week was our best week ever in terms of revenues. Our losses went down from 1.2 million in October of 07 to 270,000 in October of 08. And we think we're going to be make money in October of 09 because what we sell, which is connectivity to the internet by people who are not donors, we haven't seen any decrease at all in people willing to connect to the internet. So there's some businesses like basic telecom, some basic internet that are not affected. And also one thing is to be affected if you're Google, but if you have a new concept that is catching up and growing, it's not going to grow less because the unemployment is 7% or 11% because you have such a strong trend going that it's not going to be affected by that. So I, I think there's a lot of issues to consider beyond the macro. Yeah, I, I wrote this on my blog a couple of weeks ago. Uh, of the companies that, that are generating revenues in our portfolio, almost every single one of them is having record days and record months right now. Uh, and, and, and part of it is that we don't finance business to business. So, so I understand that if 
in that sector, it's a different story. Businesses are, are cutting back and not, not buying. Um, and we also don't, uh, we don't finance companies that um, are selling big ticket items to consumers. But in most of our companies are in businesses that fortunately for now are doing pretty well. And so I, I, I'm not as, I, I think the problem that we have is more of a capital markets and access to capital and the fact that everybody's worth 50% less than they were six months ago problem. That's a huge problem. But I actually don't think that the world's going to blow apart and the world as we know it is over. So let's talk about access to, to capital. It's a, there is kind of this, the past years, I've seen like new forms of investment entities coming up. Um, uh, we've seen, you know, groups like Y Combinators doing some kind of new C deals, but we've seen also uh, corporations creating internal funds. We've seen Google investing, we've seen Facebook creating a fund, we've seen BlackBerry creating a fund. Um, a few days ago, The Guardian announced that uh, in the UK, the government is, is putting up a one billion pound fund. Uh, so do you think that all these new opportunities of getting access to capital for entrepreneurs, are going to be for you, uh, are going to make your life harder? And do you think in particular that the initiative of the UK government for those who make deals in the UK, but I heard it's also happening in, Europe, in Ireland and in Spain, are going to be a good thing or a bad thing? Uh, if I can answer for Europe, no, please. no, I wanted to say that that is a very good point that in Europe there is going to be, and maybe in the States too, but the States have only seems to help very, very big businesses because the way lobbying works in America, it works best if you are big and decadent than if you're up and coming. Um, Europe has more of a diversity of funds and subsidies and all sorts of uh, weird sources of capital. And I think those will be very big in Europe uh, next year. So th there's really a difference between the, um, the what we would call the incubators or so Y Combinator, Techstars, and so on and so forth, that basically take entrepreneurs and projects which are extremely early stage. Even, even for people like me who do early stage stuff, they are too early. So they will sort of give them a, sh uh, a chance to develop the, um, the idea into a prototype or product, get minimal funding to really get them going, and to have a, a chance to prove an initial milestone that will make them fundable. In some cases, as you pointed out, they actually go straight to making some money and then don't talk to us for a period of time, which is fine. On, on the sort of government side, I actually think that what the French have done um, with the CIR, the Premium Pro Recherche, where you basically get some of your R&D budget sort of reimbursed, is actually a good way of, of doing it. Having this notion of a government becoming a VC on one side, you know, could give access to capital to people who would otherwise not, not be able to, um, to get some money, but we also fund things that shouldn't get funded. And there is a, a natural selection process in, in the VC world where only the projects which are viable are funded. And therefore, I'm concerned about this notion of overflow of capital towards projects which shouldn't get that money. Eric? Yeah, I'm, I'm a big believer of the free market when the operators of the free market are educated, sophisticated agents. Not necessarily the case when you buy, uh, you know, when you, are, when you have old ladies who buy uh, products from their banks when not even the bankers understand what they are selling. But in the case of venture capitalists, in theory, we have educated, sophisticated operators and the market is the market forces are the best way to ensure that it works well. So when you have the uh, governments, whether in the UK or in France or somewhere else, or in the US for this matter, with the SBIC, yeah. mm -hmm. that uh, starts meddling with the, with the market, creates inefficiencies, um, that makes some people happy for a very short period of time, and a lot of unhappy people on the long term. So I'm, I'm very much, as you can see, not very much supportive of that. Good. Good. I don't, I don't have much to say on this one. I think everyone sort of nailed it. Sure, we have like uh, five minutes. I want to uh, take a few minutes for questions from the public, but just before, uh, you know, there's always this question, what kind of recommendation would you give to an entrepreneur coming to you, raising money right now? I'd like to do a different exercise right now. Think about the company of your portfolio right now and try to imagine the way they should pitch today to you if they were coming to you. Like, 
for example, you know, Twitter in your portfolio would come to you, what would be the best way for them to pitch you today? You know, a company for you in your portfolio, how they would pitch you today, etc. Well, the best way to pitch me is to not even pitch me, is to send me a link to your, your service existing on the web, uh, and hopefully I'll find it useful, and I'll start using it, and I'll see the power of it, and I'll get so excited that I'll call you up and say I want to invest. That's how we invest. Uh, the unfortunate fact is that I'd say more than 50%, maybe as much as two-thirds of the investments we make, we see them at, as, a, as a service first, and then we call up the company and say, we want to invest. And so the people who come pitch us, and we've never used their service before, it's kind of backwards, and it doesn't pay off very high. No, no I just wanted to say that I'm the only one in this panel who I invest only my own money, and I never raise money from other people to invest, so I don't have an investment committee, and I don't have uh, to respond to anybody, and if I fuck up, it's my fault. And, and I lose my own money. So, I, but surprisingly, I still agree with Fred that I do the same thing. I, people talk to me, ah, I wanna talk to her. I say, show me the, show me the product. I'm sorry that I'm, I have a cold. Show me the product, show me what you have on the net. And it's through the net that then I say, oh great, I wanna talk to you. So we actually do the same thing. I think that when you invest in the consumer internet, like, like a lot of us do, it's basically show first and then pitch afterwards. What, what's happening when they have nothing to show? They have no site, it's just the beginning. Well, it's tough because at the end of the day, the, ex the kind of expectation on this side is that because it's so cheap to start and build and sort of almost release a product, that we, we won't fund that initial development. You're going to have to find you know, friends and family, your own sort of savings or whatever to build that initial sort of prototype or mock-ups even of the site, of the service, of things that you're planning to, um, to build, because going just conceptual in the consumer internet world just doesn't work. So, yeah, so I, I would um, amend what uh, Fred just said. I think I tend to be very careful about myself. So if I like something, I'm, I'm thinking, okay, I'm not, I'm a market of one, and market of one is not enough. And even if I talk to two of my partners, that's market of three, and it's not statistically correct. So we tend to uh, take our time and look at the, you know, what the market is saying about the thing. So I mean, sometimes it's even extreme. In, in the case of Quipe, which is a company we recently invested in, we are very happy about the investment. The company is growing like crazy. But the first time they come to see us, like, uh, we said no. And they unfortunately got funded by someone else first. So we said, hey, you know, that's life. And we kept tracking them. So we kept tracking them. I had uh, breakfast with uh, Stefan Rumbacher, the, uh, the founder, very often. I saw them hire the right people and so on. And once they, uh, they were ready to, before they got ready to raise their next fund, their next round of funding, we actually preempted the, the round by talking to them first. So just that, I want to reemphasize that. The, the most recent investment that we made was a company called Boxy. And I told the story on my blog. They came to see me three times in the past year, and all three times I said no. But they kept, per, they were persistent without being annoying, that's important. And the final time I couldn't deny, they had 50,000 people using the product, and they had another 50,000 people who wanted to use the product that they couldn't give invites to. And that was the point where I said, okay, I get it. You know, people want to use this. So I think just because someone says no doesn't mean it's no forever. Yeah, so I think don't it's, it's a very good point. No, for us, not no. means not yet. Right. But you said that. before that you would say less, more no next year, so no is not no, so it's more yes? Not this year. Oh, yeah, I'm mixed year. up anyway. Uh, we have maybe time for one question. Do we have, Loic, do we have time for one question? Yeah, one or two questions no, from the audience. Yeah. <laughs> Over there. Say your name shortly and shoot. Hi, uh, my name is Axel Schmiegelow. I'm a serial entrepreneur from... Uh, from Germany, I'm involved in Seven Load. Um, there, there's a problem of logic in, in how the investment world is reacting to the crisis. Uh, I know few cases of companies uh, that have been sold earlier than five years after their inception. So um, if you're not funding in 2009, how long do you think this recession is gonna take place? Uh, till 2013 or? Um, if only we knew. Maybe you can have a reaction to that. 
So the question is, how long is the, is the recession during going to go for? No, no, no. The question is, um, what's, you know, don't you think that uh, end of 2009 is a good time to start again funding since, in any case, uh, valuations are down. This is the best time for an entrepreneur to start. And the, by the time the, ex the, the, the companies you invest in are ready for an exit, we must have overcome this, this recession and we must be back in bull markets. Sure. I, 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 think, I don't think anybody said that they're not funding in 2009. In fact, Eric made the essential point, which is that you, in this business, you always have to be funding. The way I like to think about it is, we have a number. In our business, it's about $30 million. We want to put out about $30 million every year, year after year after year. And in the very bullish, most valuation crazy market, we want to put out $30 million. And in the worst bear market ever, we want to put out $30 million. Because every year, there's going to be five or 10 or 50 or 100 great companies formed. And we've got to be in one or two of them. So I, I don't think you should ever try to time the market in the venture business. Well, and I think what I was saying, or I know what I was saying. I'm not sure what you understood. But I was saying that, unfortunately, the, the venture business as a whole is wounded. There are a number of funds who are you know, not sure they're going to get uh, funded. They are not sure. They may. They are not sure. So that pushes a number of operators in this market to be extremely prudent, to freeze investments. So next year, it's going to be more difficult for um, entrepreneurs to raise money from a number of, of funds. There are quite a few funds. So there are like 400 funds in Silicon Valley alone. There are 200 funds in, in Europe. So that takes a number of players out. It's going to be more difficult for entrepreneurs to raise money. It doesn't mean it will be impossible because Fred and, uh, and I, and to a certain extent, if you can reach Jeff in Silicon Valley, we will be investing, but there will be less people investing. That was my point. And I think the so early stage, there will still be financings. What I'm worried about myself is what sort of milestones or, or results my own companies will have to show for, you know, to get their next round done. That's, that's the big trick for me. And I just wanted to say that at Fon, we raised 32 million. We needed another million and a half. And I decided to, so my partners are eBay, British Telecom, uh, Janos and Nicholas, uh, Google, Index, Sequoia. And there was a whole debate. How much, what is the valuation now for those million and a half that we need now that the valuations of many of the companies that invested with us are down 50 to 70%. So I cut the debate short, and I l I'm lending the company the money, so we don't even talk when you need to talk about valuation. All right, well, we have to finish. Thank you very much for uh, your attention and listening. Thank you for, to the panelists. Thanks, Oyel. So, yeah.